Hey, how are you all doing? My name is Kevin Devani, the host of the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show and the Total Connector Show. Uh, as I'm a huge fan, you know, of uh, both Stephanie von Jahn and Eric Kaysen, they both write really deeply uh, enlightening educational articles and I really appreciate the work and it's 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 fat, it's fantastic it's just it's just fantastic so um we're going to talk uh, together with stephanie we're going to talk with eric Kaysen, who written you know a number of uh, beautiful articles on self-sovereignty you know crypto sovereignty bitcoin uh one of them is the political theology of bitcoin uh, on his medium.com page and the other one is messianic bitcoin on his own website, CryptoSovereignty.org. And, you know, we talk about uh, the root uh, causes, the, 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 you know, the, the, the very rooted criminality and illegitimacy of the various foundations, the various structures that we are being uh, enslaved by, controlled and uh, coerced, oppressed, uh, violently oppressed and, um, yeah, the question is, you know, when the central bank is above any law whatsoever, what kind of obedience do we owe to, you know, to these structures, to these entities? Would it be national, supranational, or central banks, complicit, you know, in collusion with uh, governments? So, really excited to have Stephanie von Jahn and Eric Kaysen on my show back again. And, um, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Kevan Davani, and subscribe to my podcast platforms, anchor.fm slash Kevan Davani. And please give me a follow on Twitter. It really helps uh, distribute this knowledge as, you know, as efficiently as possible. And it also helps my work, my educational work, which I've been doing more than two years, Bitcoin only. And thank you so much again for your support and for listening. And without further ado, Stephanie von Jahn and Eric Kaysen. Okay, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My very special guests are Eric Kaysen and Stephanie von Jahn. You've you've been both of you on my show. And so, how are you guys doing? Thanks so much for your time. Doing good this morning. Thanks for having us. Yeah, fine. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Okay, so um, so as the working title of this episode, Truth But Not Authority Makes Legitimacy, uh, implies, we're going to talk about a bunch of things. I mean, as long as the time allows, because I know we, uh, um, Eric is a little bit under time pressure. We've got less than an hour, but I think we can, you know, pack in the most essential points we wanted to cover. Look, there are two really, you know, as, as usual, two excellent articles that you've written and we both read. Uh, one of them is uh, the political theology of Bitcoin, cryptosovereignty.org on medium.com. And the other one, which I also love, uh, but which I, you know, partially speaking for myself, do not agree maybe to, uh, to a certain extent, but uh, that's what we're here for. Uh, so it's on cryptosovereignty.org on Eric Kaysen's website, and it's called Messianic Bitcoin from uh, September 14, 2020. And there is one paragraph, if I may just quote out of your article. Uh, I quote, it's, um, it's a very, let me just uh, share the screen here so that everyone can maybe knows where we, where we are. So this is the, uh, the paragraph that somehow for me personally summarizes uh, the essential points or from my comprehension. Here we stand at the edge of a new era, a new dawn from which humanity can rise from the bondage of fiat money and create a radically different future that is better for all. Bitcoin contains the power to create a new commonwealth from cryptography where truth, not authority, becomes the final purveyor of legitimacy. Bitcoin has initiated a struggle against a globalized world order where the nation state and their infinite fiat money and propensity for violence can no longer hold sway for the very thing that signify is not money, wealth, or power, but illegitimacy, incompetence, and evil. Through the infinite power that all states have declared they are entitled to, they have created the very condition that proves their illegitimacy 
and the need for them to be totally and completely destroyed. I mean, it's, it's just beautiful, you know, also your language, the way you write. Uh, and uh, this paragraph, this very paragraph sums up uh, many of the points that, uh, Eric, that we have been also talking about, because what I also, you know, love talking about is, uh, you know, this big elephant in the room, the illegitimacy of the central banking structure with its complicit government, which stands above any law whatsoever. So, Stephanie, why don't you just kick it off? Because you had a lot of, you know, uh, 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 detailed questions. But then maybe you know I can just uh, come in and 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 um, um, uh, 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 yeah, comment a little bit or ask uh, Eric my more specific questions when it comes to those uh, uh, points. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Eric, thank you so much for the article. So um, what really stood out for me is that you said truth is the new legitimacy and not authority. And I haven't seen anyone else like stressing it to this extent. And this is really, really incredible how you were like um, really bringing this to the focus that the truth is important, that we go beyond the lies, we go beyond essentially then all the power structures and that you were actually nailing it down to truth and not some other concept or moral, but to truth. So that was really fascinating. But um, yeah, I think we can discuss many things. You were also talking about the sovereign exempt exceptions. So essentially to make some exceptions and then um, to, to reduce the right of the individual and to push through some, how did you say, emergency legal decrees. Mm -hmm. And um, well, we know how this can look like now. So um, this is like very on point for, for the time period we live in. So maybe we go a little bit also in this, but um, yeah. And also you were, yeah, the Hobbes Leviathan. I saw this in your article that you said, authority, not truth makes legitimacy. This is what he said. And you, and this mm -hmm. is why I thought, oh, wow, you're actually saying the opposite. So we can put this around and say truth is what creates legit legitimacy and not authority. And this is, kind of why we came up with this uh, title for today. Great, yeah, I mean, um, so specifically, like like most of uh, this idea specifically that truth, not authority, creates legitimacy is an inversion of the Hobbesian dictum that essentially he uses to surmise the entirety of what he's talking about in Leviathan. And I think it's really interesting because uh, Leviathan being really the, the first political book on statecraft. Uh, he, he, you know, if you haven't had an opportunity to read it, it's, it's quite an eloquent and difficult read. But he's very pedantic about this idea that, that the sovereign, because of what he entails in the entirety of, you know, his existence and being is the law itself, that he can actually circumnavigate, he can circumvent truth through his raw authority and seeing that, uh, you know, the, the classic nation state that was created with the Treaty of Westphalia is what we've currently inherited today as the modern nation state. Uh, they have pushed this idea to a very, very extreme place where literally whatever they say uh, becomes law, which also ironically is what fiat means in Latin is to mean let, to let it be done, to, to just simply create it. Um, and then on the, the points of the, the emergency decree or the state of emergency, uh, that's specifically kind of taken from, from Carl Schmitt and his political theology. And uh, Schmitt's very pedantic about the idea of that the, the norm doesn't tell us what the, the law itself actually does. He points out that the exception is what really creates the fullness of the identity of what the law can do. And I think uh, here in the United States, specifically starting... Uh, well, it happened before the Patriot Act, but the Patriot Act was really kind of the the first true extreme steps beyond the law through the emergency decree. And here we are 20 years later that the same uh, emergency decrees are still ruling that the state has actually put itself into this place where it it, it no longer has any tie to, to any sort of Democratic or Republican functions that they're really just various bureaucrats that sort of get to, to make these emergency decrees that go well beyond any capacity of what the law ever allowed. And what we're seeing now with coronavirus, with these lockdowns, with curfew, with them 
uh, destroying vast swaths of the economy uh, single-handedly. You know, like I, I read a statistic that yesterday that here in the Bay Area that half of small businesses have closed. Uh, like that, it's devastating. And I want to be very clear. Like I, I, I don't want to say that the virus isn't dangerous, that we shouldn't be wary of it, that people shouldn't uh, be trying to protect themselves. But to give this power to the state, uh, it... it not only is it illegal on its face, but uh, it's very dangerous because like the state isn't exactly known for like giving back power after they've taken it. In addition to the fact that um, I'm very worried about how they seem to be using the digital panopticon to not only track and catalog people, but, but there seems to be a very ominous threat of them cataloging and using this data for pretty much whenever they want, they can start labeling people as enemies and depriving them of rights and throwing them into prisons, you know? And so that's kind of what has us arrive at a place that we need to start really discussing uh, how do we resist these things? How do we fight back? How do we create new methodologies to resist, which, you know, has us all be here because Bitcoin seems to be the preeminent object to do that. Yeah, Rothbard was saying um, that wars essentially benefit the state. So I was always asking who benefits because it's not the population. But uh, after I went into the rabbit hole, I realized, yeah, the state is benefiting from wars because they can then impose more draconian uh, measures that couldn't be imposed during peacetime. And, you know, wars can be uh, taken more broadly, like wars, like um, war against drugs, war against um against the virus, war against terrorism. So not only like the direct fighting wars. So um, that's just uh, an amazing analysis from him. It was from Anatomy of the State. So one, well, I'd even go, go past that. Uh, and, and both Foucault and, and Schmidt point this out is that the, the sort of wars that we're engaging in now, they're no longer these status boundary wars uh, that, that, ha that are, uh, he uses the word bracketed wars. And by unbracketed wars, he, he means that these are much larger conflicts that involve citizens and their governments against one another. So much so to the extent that I would actually say, like, we're engaged in a general globalized civil war at this point where all governments have violated all citizens' rights and procedures constitutionally. And now we're, we're in this place where we actually see... Uh, you know, I, I would call these people the, the, the men without law. Like these are individuals that because of their authoritarian positions that they've taken in governments, they've given themselves the decrees to step out beyond the power of law itself into their own authoritarian decrees. Uh, and it's very scary because like we've, there's a long chain of history of seeing what happens when governments declare themselves above and beyond the rights of people. And it, usually ends uh, with lots of brutality, murder, and uh, destruction. And I would feel much, much more scared if we didn't have something like Bitcoin and cryptography, because despite how dark everything is, uh, cryptography is this shining light kind of in the darkness that allows for us a real ability to be able to communicate and transact with one another without the state being able to spy on us, which uh, can become the bedrock for us to be able to reorganize ourselves in a much more powerful way. Uh, Eric, um, you know, when I studied law, um, I vaguely remember, because <laughs> I didn't pay much, pay that much attention at that time when it was about law and philosophy or philosophy of law or something like that. Um, uh, and there was, I, I remember there was a guy, a philosopher named Waltz or Waltzer and and we were uh, we I mean, when I read this, it was was really uh, very um, uh, because it was really impressive for me because the thought of it because the connection was of course you know with the national socialism you know Nazi Germany uh, when a when a law or when a, a status of uh, you know of the government or any law in, enforced or enacted becomes so so unjust so uh, so cruel and so atrocious that you have we, the people, we human beings have the moral ethical obligation to defy, to, to, to resist and to, to, to not obey. And we are at this point. Uh, I mean, what do you think? But the, the problem is that the governments 
as territorial monopolies, as always, also Dr. Torsten Poyer, the Austrian economist, always, always says, have the monopoly and with its supranational organizations, such as whatever uh, the European Union organizations, for example, any other supranational international organizations with their supranational uh, monopoly on violence, aggression, coercion, enforcement, right? And the threat, you know, to imprison you or whatever. Um, it's, it makes it uh, literally like a life and death thing because either we're going to defy and to resist and to not obey, or we just have to acquiesce, acquiesce, uh, I think that's the word, you know, to this, um, well, to this atrocious, you know, aggressive, coercive, uh, violent uh, entity or entities. I mean, where are we at this point, at this juncture? <laughs> oh, well, I, I think we're at a very dangerous crossroads because it's clear that like, they're, they're kind of assembling all of the different uh, techniques and abilities to be able to essentially implement kind of Chinese style surveillance across the board on everyone, you know, no matter which nation state that they're in. Um, and furthermore, to your point about the monopoly on violence, it's pretty interesting that uh, states have this sort of secret agreement with one another that their entitlement to violence against their own citizens, that's sort of their, their own business within the, the classic Westphalian idea of what goes on inside of your borders is your business. Um, and, I, and I think the truth is, is that uh, utilizing cryptography and tools like Bitcoin, we can choose to rebuild the internet using strong encryptions and techniques to reorganize and make ourselves much more powerful as various groups of citizens. Uh, or governments are going to take these tools and they're going to use it to spy on us forever and make sure that uh, thought itself becomes a crime, that there becomes an ability to... Here in the United States, we have habeas corpus, but it's pretty clear that uh, that's being suspended and that uh, people are being intermed in ways that will allow for them to never have a trial. Uh, and it's deeply Kafkaesque. It's, uh, it, it's almost funny with like how Kafkaesque it is because... <laughs> You know, we have random bureaucrats showing up and arresting people, refusing to tell them what crime they've been committed for to that. They're not, you know, that they haven't even been accused of a crime. And it's a uh, it's a very, very dangerous place. And I would feel much more scared if we didn't have something like Bitcoin. And I feel like as this sort of brinkmanship with the state escalates where they're going to try to control Bitcoin, try to control people, try to make the lockdowns work. Uh, that, that power is going to start slipping through their hands. And I think the final point is, is that as people, we need to be ready and prepared for the fact that uh, this could end very poorly. You know, and like uh, as Bitcoiners, I sort of see us as the, the new international vanguardist class that's willing to stand up and fight against governments. And, and it's sort of hilarious that... Uh, at this point in time, like we have all of these kind of contradictions fusing back into each other that like as Bitcoiners, you know, like we're we're sort of the preeminent uh, Austrian thinkers that are trying to present this object of uh, free monetary exchange and free markets. Yet we're also taking these sort of deeply socialist ideals like a revolutionary vanguard and pushing that to the forefront and saying people use this object to help liberate yourself from the slave status of the state. Like, don't let them steal all your wealth, don't let them destroy your monetary base. Um, yeah, and it, it, it's really exciting, you know, like I, I would much rather have this future where we get to fight them as opposed to uh, pushing it off for another generation to need to do that work. Yeah, you were men mentioning the socialist values. So essentially what the socialists did, they took the values of libertarians and then packaged this up into uh, we need an, a form of state that does everything good for us and like um, re redistributes wealth and kind of bringing things together that don't fit together. And it's just uh, a contradiction in itself. So, yeah. Well, and, and what I'd point to is that uh, like anarchism was originally part of the socialist contingency, like in the Working Men's Association and through Bakun's leadership, they eventually split over the idea of utilizing the state to create a dictatorship of the proletariat. And I think it's pretty cool that like, we've kind of come full circle to where it's like, hey, check it out. Like there's a way that we can actually fight and destroy the state 
without needing to go through this oscillation of taking over the state and re-implementing all of its authoritarian decrees in, in just a different form. And to me, like that's part of what's messianic is that we're, we're not talking about another oscillation within the law. Like we're talking about destroying it and creating something totally new and novel that we've never seen before. Uh, and to my point about the messianism is uh, like, I actually think that this is an astrological process because of as things sort of escalate, I think the state's pretty much going to like unmask itself as just being raw authoritarian rule. Uh, and on the other side, we're going to have that the actual good and truth of like what Bitcoin is, how even if I am somebody that is your adversary that wants to harm you, you can trust in the protocol and what it offers you for the very real truth uh, that's enshrined within it. That I, e even if I'm trying to compromise you in some way, I need to slip around the protocol somehow and do it, you know, uh, through a man in the middle attack or any number of things that's going to expose your private key to me. But if you can actually secure that key yourself, uh, then I, I don't have a way to overcome that, at least not at this point in time. So with the power of Bitcoin and the tools that we have, uh, cryptography, uh, you know, the code, uh, the, the, the truth, you know, that, that is so inherent in it, um, it's all digital. Um, and, you know, we just we just a couple of minutes before we talked about, you know, violence, aggression, monopoly and aggression, violence, enforcement, coercion, um, you know, and all the criminality that goes with it. Um, my concern is that, you know, I've been, I've been brainstorming a lot about this. It's like uh, there's not one criminality that's been not perpetrated and been not committed systematically by the government in collusion with, this, with the central banks and their executioners. You know, whether it be rape, systematic theft, wars, plunder, murder, corruption, deepest corruption, uh, deceit, deception, fraud, scientific fraud. I mean, anything you can think of is, is like there's nothing they haven't done. And I'm like, OK, let's just let's just suppose let's just imagine for a moment we finally got it. We got this intransigence minority, as it's called, or the critical mass adoption. But then I'm like, okay, we've got the militarized police, we've got the military industrial corporate complex with its intelligence. What are we going to do about that? Because that's the like the the you know the power structure of you know the enforcement structure of 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 coercion, right? Of of mm -hmm. aggression, of violence, of enforcement. So uh, I don't see a problem like dismantling, making like the the, the political structures obsolete with Bitcoin, you know. But what about all these like huge, vast structures that are in existence right now, you know, globally, well, nationally, uh, supranationally? I think there's kind of two distinct ways that it goes. One is, is that, uh, you know, it, it, it's pretty clear the writing's on the wall that uh, hyperinflation is coming, that central banks of the world have uh, overstepped their bounds and printed out so much money that it's going to have vast and horrible economic consequences. Uh, and with that, like Bitcoin is going to become this preeminent object that continues to accrue more and more wealth and value inside of itself because of its mechanics. Uh, and one is, is like that, that can become the very real uh, wealth that we'll utilize to, to try to set up forms and alternatives. Um, and also like, I, I frankly believe that like the, the state's probably going to hunt a lot of Bitcoiners down and like it's, it's going to be bad. You know, like I, I don't really expect for myself to come out of, of this situation relatively unscathed with how how big my mouth has been over the last couple of years. Now you're scaring um, me, Eric. <laughs> I, you know, like I'm, I'm just trying to be realistic. We're all exposed uh, like <laughs> a, a bit. And I think that 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 goes to show um, sort of how serious the consequences is. And I've been thinking about this like. I sincerely believe that Bitcoin is an object of war because of the way that it sort of forces and compels these things. Now, if we're really lucky, what will happen is we'll go into to extreme hyperinflation, uh, that the continuous printing of money will impoverish anybody that's getting a wage that's in USD or whatever fiat form. And hopefully, you know, the armed forces of the world will essentially be like, well, we keep getting this crappy money that doesn't do anything for us. And frankly, we can plead with people, you know, set down your arms. And uh, one of the other more extreme ideas I have is that essentially we invert the panopticon in such a way that it creates surveillance that we go, look, like 
all you people that are out there that are part of governments doing evil shit, like we know who you are, we know where you live, we know what you're doing, put down your arms, join us, we'll forgive you, we don't want to harm you, but if you want to arm up and be part of the state, well, check it out, we now have assassination contracts and other things. Uh, and I hope it doesn't come to that, but I think the truth is is that uh, the, the panopticon is not going away, and the best thing that we can do is utilize it for the people for our own freedoms, and I think that uh, the quicker that we can understand, because I think the, the other thing at the end of the day is, is that we will always have the population on our side for, for all of the police and soldiers and individuals that want to perpetrate violence. There, there's a hundred times more people that don't want that. And through us being able to identify people on either side, I think is a, a huge object of power. Uh, I think the more likely scenario is, is that like this drags out into like a pretty violent and uh, terrifying conflict where, you know, you have the SS show up in the middle of the night to black bag people and to take them away and not tell them where they're going. That uh, and, I, and I think places like here in the United States, because we have the right to bear arms, like I, I think it'll get pretty violent. And I think also uh, what people are doing with, with the manufacturing of arms through 3D printing and other things is an extremely powerful notion and mode that uh, what I would love to see in the United States is essentially that as things get politicized, that we'll try to essentially push all states back or push all power back to state governments as opposed to the federal government. And we'll be able to have a Soviet style dissolution where essentially we say, hey, all 50 states, take your share. We'll all go our same ways. Maybe we'll recreate republics together or we'll just remain independent states. But I mean, Stuff's going to get really wild here pretty soon, and uh, it's really hard to see what the outcome is going to look like. Yeah, so you mentioned violence um, very often, that you expect that there is more violence, that there's violence between the people and the state or the state and forces, essentially. So um, I actually think that when the people start to become violent, this is then the excuse for the government to bring in the military and, you know, they have arms, you know, here in Germany, we cannot have like guns or anything. So, you know, the people are in a bad situation, let's say we cannot defend ourselves. Um, in America, it might be a little bit different, you know, but here, I mean, there's no chance. We cannot be violent, actually, actually. And we have a resistance movement. And that is nonviolence. So they're always saying they're trying to get more people in to wake more people up so that we are becoming the majority and then that more and more people realize that are actually working for the state like the police or the soldiers that they're like on the wrong side let's say on the side that it's not for the people so this is kind of the goal of the resistance movement in um in germany and um there's also this peaceful movement so um what do you think about this um do you think this is really an opportunity to to use violence so as i said i i here in germany i don't think so in america i i cannot assess it really well because i'm not there but i i could consider this maybe it doesn't work so well I, you know, I don't think violence is ever a, a good option. Uh, and I would love for, for uh, a peaceful, nonviolent movement to lead such a thing. And, and I really hope that that's how it's going to go, you know, uh, here in the United States as well. I don't have a lot of hope just because of, uh, you know, frankly, because people are so well armed here. Uh, but with that being said, I, I do ultimately think that these movements need to lead themselves through nonviolence because like it, it, if it becomes a violent conflict, like we're just talking about the exact same oscillations of state power all over again. It's just about people trying to, to mount the political object in order to be able to legitimize their violence, which uh, part of my belief system is like there, there is no such thing as legitimate violence. Violence in, an, in the action of itself is illegitimate. Uh, and that's one of the great things is that even if they show up to, you know, black bag me, I have my multi-sig scheme in such a way that, you know, I have individuals that will be able to take my money and hopefully be able to use that to either liberate me or to help further the cause. Uh, and I, and speaking to my point about surveillance, like, I think that that's one of the, the techniques that can really be utilized in a powerful way in a nonviolent method is that once you actually identify these people that are perpetrating these pretty horrific crimes, I think, uh, what was it in Serbia? There was the Opdor movement, which was part of 
uh, when Serbia was uh, under the rule of Slobodan Milosevic and there was deep brutality that was going on by the police forces, what these people chose to do was document the police that were committing these crimes and then literally go to, you know, their kid's school and be like, hey, well, like, check it out. This is Jimmy's dad. He's like raping this woman. Like, Jimmy, you should like go home and like talk to your family about this. And these police got so embarrassed about what these horrible things they were doing that when it came time to like show up to next to protest, to, like beat people down, they're like, you know, like I'm, I'm out. Like I don't want to participate anymore because of, of how horrific it is. And to me, like that's also one of the refreshing things is is that uh, even the people that are involved in these deeply authoritarian movements, I do think that they can be reached through showing, hey, like this isn't good. You shouldn't be doing this. Uh, and then I think even those that can't be reached, that ultimately becomes a question about what do we do when we confront direct evil? You know, when they, the one, there are these people that are doing these horrific crimes and they can't recognize what it is. I think that's where we start to ask ourselves, how are we going to respond to it? And I think that there's many, many powerful methodologies that don't involve violence. Mm -hmm. and, and that's my deepest hope for it. And that's one of the things that also makes me believe that Bitcoin is messianic is that uh, like it's a totally nonviolent object of exchange that has no physicality about it so it entertains these deeply non-violent notions much much better than violence which you know ultimately comes back to this world and people taking up arms or whatever against one another excellent eric thank you very much i totally agree with that uh, eric um you know uh, the as as it is you know evolving right now you know the, the adoption rate by institutions whatever companies and maybe even soon pension funds and now you know we heard that Iran's central uh, bank or national bank of Iran is uh, uh, has somehow pushed for the enactment of a law that um, somehow enables uh, the purchase of Bitcoin directly from the miners in Iran. So what I'm I think what I'm trying to get at is that. Uh, do you think we're going then maybe towards sort of a this this it is a, as a transitional phase into sort of a competitive phase where you know jurisdictional arbitrage uh, governments and uh, and and uh, nation states are now competing with one another and that is you know sort of uh, beneficial uh, to, for this whole process uh, and and. Oh. and all, you know, and also just one one more point is like you said, you know, I mean, I know I don't want to like paint it all negative, but it's like a lot of people within the governmental or even military structure or, you know, uh, intelligence structures. These are like family people, too. You know, it's like it's not like everything white and black. There's a play people within these structures. Uh, I mean, if we just take whatever Edward Snowden or, or you know, people like these, uh, you know, who are insiders who who do want to, you know, who have family of themselves, who do exactly what's going on, you know, who, uh, who have been really deep down the rabbit hole. And maybe they want to help. Maybe there are much more, many more whistleblowers and insiders and people who want to help, you know, who want to come out of this rabbit hole and, and really come, you know, to the uh, side of the light, <laughs> you know. But do you think this is all coming together, like converging? I, I do. And, and uh, like, this is this is one of my deepest hopes is that, like, through, through this engagement kind of uh, initiating with Iran's central bank starting to accumulate Bitcoin through miners selling it, uh, to me, that... There's no way that intelligence communities across the world don't look at that and make that into a national security imperative. I, I would be very surprised if in the United States that there haven't been national security briefings around this and about the need to start putting bo both energy uh, and capital accumulation towards Bitcoin, which is, is really great because this forces us into a neo-mercantilist neo era where essentially the accumulation of Bitcoin is going to help uh really ensure that that utilizing these violent methodologies and that continuing to to print and create money uh it's just not going to work and furthermore like as bitcoin forces this agenda of legitimacy uh, i do think that there i'd say the majority of people that are involved in the intelligence communities uh, i actually think that they sincerely have their heart in the right place but there there hasn't been a deep enough uh, philosophical discussion and inquiry in themselves to really understand what's happening. And I think that part of this is going to force those sort of dialogues. 
And my great hope is, is that uh, like by the time the war against the Bitcoiners is really to initiate, there's going to be enough people on the inside that'll be like, whoa, whoa, hey, no, like what we need to do is actually integrate this into our forms of government, realize we can't print money infinitely to actually have uh, programs that acknowledge this. Uh, and that that's really one of the, the greatest highlights is maybe this intellectual war is already being carried out. And uh, I, I actually have another piece on my blog called uh, Theory of the Crypto Partisan, which is essentially about how the topology of war has now opened up to include the entirety of the Internet. But furthermore, because of the way that people can kind of put on the cloak of anonymity and, and go into the web and maintain that, there's a very real possibility that there are people deep within the national security networks that are already on our side that are doing maybe development work for Bitcoin or are uh, ensuring that, you know, the correct algorithms that can't be cracked are being selected for for things that, uh, you know, that things like Sh Schnorr signature are going to be able to actually get deployed and not have any any sort of vulnerabilities about them. Uh, and, and to me, like, it's all of these assemblages of, of things that are sort of operating together that, to me, is what allows for Bitcoin to be messianic, because it, it's forcing this actual uh, ontological questioning of, like, what human existence means, what security is, what wealth is, what, what uh, commonality that we share is all about. And it's really powerful and incredible, because I think for the first time, we're starting to see uh, global humanity recognizing itself first and foremost as global humanism as opposed to various identities of nationalities. Very enlightening, Eric, very enlightening. I totally agree with you. And uh, you know what? Um, I mean, this this uh, the reason also I'm doing this podcast is like to give people not only the educational tools, materials, uh, you know, people like you and, and, and Stephanie von Jan, you know, uh, she writes also, you know, beautiful articles and it's all about education. But, you know, in order to not to stay, you know, in this echo chamber or in this intellectual niche is like give people not only hope, but some, you know, realistic vision. You know, not utopia, but a vision. Like, and I'm sometimes uh, it's it's really uh, it's um, uh, it's somehow uh, I'm somehow desperate because <laughs> I'm I'm like, what? Why are you guys? Why are you people? You know, why why is humanity not waking up and 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 seeing what it is? It's you know, you've probably read also Robert Breedlove's articles about how much time we've been lost. I mean, we've been losing uh, and, and been stolen from uh, mm -hmm. by the central banks and the governments. You know, I mean, how many trillions of hours of of um, of, of time and and time converts to me. You know, what does it mean? Like in practicality, I mean, <laughs> it means the technological innovation has been stolen from us. The abundance, the prosperity, the freedom, the joy. You know, so um, I don't know, maybe maybe if we want to the last 10, 15 minutes, just uh, wrap this a little bit up, but um, I'll give you both the floor. I mean, what do you guys think, I mean, is possible with Bitcoin rooted a humanity, a society, a human civilization rooted in Bitcoin? I mean, that's, uh, that, that's a big question. And I mean, to, to honestly answer it, like I... I can't answer that. Uh, what I can say is that uh, it's so far beyond what we can imagine. Uh, like this time theft that, that's been engaged in, it has calcified our vision of, of what a life looks like, what it means. Um, I mean, like the, the very real functions of the hours of the clock, you know, like that the, there is nothing in the material world that like has these numbers that correlates to it. The sun rises, the sun sets, and like those are the real functions of time. And so because we've been so deeply embedded in, in uh, you know, this capitalist slave labor mentality of I get up, I work at a job, I come home, uh, we're just so far removed from our own forms of life that aren't tethered to this thing, that aren't part of a gigantic nation state that, you know, uh, proceeds over us bureaucratically. And my hope is that with Bitcoin, uh, this totally new form of private life that, that like I can't see, it's sort of encrypted to me, if you will, that, that anybody can have. And I guess the, the best corollary that I can have is uh, like I'm a burner and I've been to Burning Man like you know, a dozen times or something. And life out there is just a complete, wacky, insane, crazy trip. 
that's really beautiful and so different and removed from anything that you can experience in this world that my hope is, is that a world that Bitcoin can create is like a much larger version of that, of uh, sincere anarchy. But with that being said, not a form of chaos, but like very similar to nature, that there are all of these fitting and moving pieces that work together that creates this incredible bloom of humanity uh, that's well beyond anything that I could actually describe here and just know that it it's a uh, it's a very beautiful form of life that is a private one that people get to have full sovereignty and agency over themselves and how they choose to create that with one another it's so cool that you mentioned burning man um so i was on ozara it's also it's one of the biggest psychedelic festivals and nice. um it's also, I think it's there are like many similarities. I've been to other festivals as well. And the freedom that you experience there, this other form of life, just being in the moment, just, you know, celebrating, enjoying life with other people. Also this community aspect, we, we don't have this anymore in our life. I mean, actually, if we could really start to think in which system are we living in? I mean, we are, uh, as you said, we wake up, go to work, come home, we're exhausted. Then we have to pay all the taxes. I mean, we have to pay taxes on so many things, on our income. If we own property, we have to uh, pay a tax on a property. There's even a tax on having a dog, I realized recently. <laughs> I mean, it's just insane. They're getting your uh, money out of the pockets, like in all ways. Also, when you consume things, you have to pay um, that, like... Um, bet on it you know yeah mm -hmm. so um and then i was always thinking okay i compared this to nature and i see like the beings that live in nature like the animals the wild animals in nature they can just you know build their houses like um, i had a look at the beaver building his house and i was thinking we cannot do this because then the police and the authorities come and say yeah you don't own this property and you don't have the um the the how do they, do they say they have like authorities to tell you whether you can build something and how high it can be and all these crazy things. So they, you, they like, they put you into the small box and this is how your whole life was framed. You cannot be creative. You cannot be free. You have to stick to the system. And this system is a complete slavery system. And mm -hmm. I haven't realized this a couple of years ago. I just took it as it is because this is what I was born into. I never questioned it. But now going through this whole libertarian idea on how could it look like having no state? Most people don't know that this is possible. I think it would be like chaos. Everything's like burning. No, it's not it could be freedom for the people and this is also like very smart of the state and of the whole educational system and also the media to frame it in this way that yeah we need the state and it serves you, us and it uh, keeps us safe and in fact this is a complete lie Absolutely. and this lie is coming to the surface now I mean, I think coronavirus kind of helps frame this the best is that it's done through a rule of fear and terror like it's not it's not about us as humans trying to stand up and work together in order to create safety and security. And ultimately, um, I think it's sort of hilarious that like uh, in Leviathan, Hobbes is like, look, like a life in nature is like this brutish, terrible existence of the war of all against all. And like the truth is, is that Rousseau's critique of that, like it's not true. Like you have the, the ignobles, uh you know, man out in nature who like, he doesn't know or understand these things of violence. And I, and I think that there's a real potential to return to a life without the state that uh, is really beautiful and powerful and uh, entails all of these really new and different ideas. And as much as we desire that, like, I, I think the truth is, is that we're gonna run into a lot of people that are so deeply locked into their fear and terror that they, frankly, like they would much rather turn the apparatus of the state against us to destroy us than to allow for us the freedom to try to create what we want on our own. Um, and I think that that process, uh, I really hope what will happen is that, you know, we'll choose to break off on our own and, and build our own societies together. Um, but it's hard to see, you know, like the, the most that I can say is that, uh, Bitcoin gives me a kind of security that I don't think can be found anywhere else with the exception of a life that is actually 
in nature by yourself where you can build a home and, and like the entity of the state doesn't exist. Like there's no, there's no person that can descend upon you and say, I have the authority to destroy this or take this from you or give me part of this. And I think it's pretty interesting that like we live in a day and age where, uh, you know, like you tell people taxation is theft and they like laugh at you. They're like, Oh, that, that's like a ridiculous notion which to me shows how far we have to go in terms of, of disassembling the, the ideological framework that's been given to us. Uh, and coronavirus is a great opportunity because like the, at least here in the United States, like the education system has been per, pretty thoroughly smashed. Um, they're trying to reestablish it in different ways, but a lot of people don't want to go back into it. And I think that uh, this is, coronavirus is giving us a really powerful opportunity to see how uh, misleading the state is like the it's pretty clear that these bozos have made this conflict much worse have made the have really destroyed the economy haven't actually corrected the problems that it's been presented and i'm really hoping that people really see the nakedness that the emperor has in so far that uh not only are they not helping us but they're like stealing from us they're printing out for all of their friends and family they're doing these extremely draconian lockdowns and other things and ultimately, you know, the, the tertiary cost of this is people are suffering incredible amounts, you know, and, uh, you know, like I, I, I'm in a, a secure place. I, I own Bitcoin. I, you know, I live in a small town. I have family and friends amongst me. Most people don't have this stuff and they're suffering. And it really breaks my heart that instead of people choosing to say, you know, maybe this state thing isn't serving us in the way that I believe it. They want to double down and be like, we just need to give more power to the state. That's what will really solve it. Mm -hmm. And it's scary because I'm not sure how you overcome that mentality of such a deep and pervasive fear that governs a, a person's entire being that they would choose to give up all of their freedom and liberty based upon this false promise that they'll be secured through the state. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned actually the Stockholm syndrome, where um, those that got abused are then loving the abuser because they gave him like some little candy. And this is exactly what we're in, actually. The people are abused. This is a kind of form of abuse when you are like stuffed into the system where you are a slave, more or less. And where you are told propaganda and all this stuff and where you're told how to behave. I mean, this is not freedom and this is not how how a human being can be. But yeah, the people already got so used to this abuse that they're not seeing this. Um, but fortunately, more and more wake up. So we see. But I agree. It's tough. Yeah, and, you know, we're we're all part of that awakening as well. Like, I think we, you know, Stephanie, you spoke to you had your own libertarian awakening and, you know, I, I had mine as well. And I think with all the content that we're producing with the new dialogues that can be had with Bitcoin, I think that this is a part of a very powerful intergenerational process where my hope is, is that when my children grow up, there's no question about, you know, the sort of political ideals that they have, the sort of money that they want to use and the sort of lives that they want to build. And, uh, you know, as dark as everything is, I do see this very beautiful light that's shining for us to follow, not just through Bitcoin and, and cryptography, but more of uh, the real knowledge and agency that we gain through understanding how these practices work. And furthermore, as we develop them more and gain new connections with other people, that's just going to bloom out into a much larger and more powerful movement to where I hope eventually it comes to a climax where we make a choice to say, you know, we're, we're going to start creating new institutions for the future that are going to better ourselves, our families, our friends, and really help rebuild community in a way that, uh, in my opinion, has been totally extinguished for, you know, several generations. And it will be very powerful to get to participate in that. And uh, to, to me, the, the power of that and the risk in choosing to do that is so much more beautiful and profound than, uh, you know, the hundred years of life that they're offering of living in this immaculate cage. <laughs> beautiful said, Eric. You know, uh, it makes me somehow simultaneously sad. I'm sad, I'm shocked, I'm, I'm really intrigued and surprised. And it's, you know, when I talk to my girlfriend and we talk about, you know, how people around us, whether it be friends, family members, you know, like, uh, 
they, they don't question anything. You know, it's like, it's like, oh my God, I mean, I don't want to even start off with Bitcoin because, or the monetary system or the structural system. It's like, they don't question anything, you know? And it's like, it's usually like the, a lot of, a lot of, if you go on the mainstream or uh, forums, you know, it's like the, the, the so-called people, you know, who are more educated, you know, who are more academics, you know, these are the people who actually, you know, who are the first ones who attack you. You know, or anybody like attack anybody who is you know, who is like uh, deviating from the norm, from the official narrative. You're you know instantaneously you know you're whatever conspiracy theorist, a criminal, uh, whatever you want to, uh, you're a murderer. It's 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 it's, uh, it's insane, and I I just don't I just don't get it. You know that people uh, are not questioning; they don't see what's coming. And what I was also going to say is like these people, depending on the, you know, on the level of the political or the power structure, I think some of them know what's, ex they know exactly what's going on. They know exactly what's coming, that the shit is going to hit the fan. And, you know, with the whatever, with the insolvencies coming, you know, the euro crash, whatever that is, you know, uh, but I'm sure, you know, Stephanie, you know, can be more, a little bit more elaborated and articulated about that, you know, what's really coming. I mean, yeah. and that's why they need this distraction with whatever it is, COVID hysteria. hysteria. I mean, I, I think a lot of people, uh, like it's similar to a cult, you know, like uh, <laughs> there, there's, a, there's a, a great documentary on Scientology that like, once you finally get to the deeper levels, like you, you realize this shit's just completely batshit crazy, but they've invested their entire life in it. Like, you know, what, what does the individual who's served 25 years in the intelligence agency when he finally realizes like, oh, like I'm participating in a vehicle that's, that's literally killing children. Like, uh, I would love for them to have the bravery to stand up and say, no, I'm not going to participate in this, but I, I don't think they're actually possible. It's possible for them. And, yeah. and I'm not sure what to tell them other than, than hoping that at some point in time there is some sort of, uh, of ethical dilemma that, that is loud enough for them to choose to turn away. But I, I don't really expect that. And I, and I think to the point about academia is like it, it's really just another form of authoritarianism. Uh, yeah. of, you know, people have spent 20 years of their life getting A's and being celebrated and being told that they have experience in this field. Uh, and I think it's hilarious because like, in my experience, turning away from all of these people and choosing to go all in on Bitcoin early on, you know, it, it completely changed my life and gave me a security in a way that I would have never had before. Meanwhile, they're like, no, like you, you need to work 40 years of your life. You need to put all your money into your 401k. You need to trust that this system's going to work. And it, and if you suck the dick like how you're supposed to, you'll get a little bit at the end, uh, you know, and, and it's really sad because instead of them stopping and saying, maybe if I take an, a risk on myself, maybe if I trust my own belief systems, maybe something yeah. better will come about from herself. And for me, that was the real turning for myself was when I was really getting into Bitcoin. I was getting all this information. And, uh, you know, I, I, I talked to people about it and they're like, no, like, stay away from this. And I had this moment where I was like, no, I would rather take a risk on this and choose to have it blow up on me than to continue participating in their slave labor system. And because I made that choice to take my capital and risk it in such a way, it paid off for me in an extraordinary way. And I hope I, I have the same hope for other people that they'll make the same choice because, uh, you know, your 401k is going to get liquidated and destroyed in the coming you know, in the coming monetary apocalypse, and it's gonna, it's, it's, it's gonna be a sad state of affairs. Beautiful said, uh, Eric. I know you have, you got to go in a few minutes. You want to close up? Like any, any other final thoughts or any other articles that you're uh, going to be publishing uh, soon or uh, you know, website? like. Uh, so, so much of my creative process is kind of a poetic thing that like is out of uh, my sort of purview and control. But I just finished a piece for uh, the next edition of the Bitcoin Times that's going to be coming out. That's about Bitcoin and the state of emergency ex explicitly. And I deal with the Schmidtian concept of what the state of emergency is. And I contrast that against uh, Walter Benjamin's theses on history, where he, in the seventh point, he presents that uh, through us understanding the real state of emergency, which is essentially us objecting and fighting back, we actually have a real chance to, to fight against fascism and win. 
And to me, Bitcoin is the real state of emergency because of, well, one, the state will actually induce a state of emergency directly by saying, hey, we got to destroy this thing before it destroys us. And to me, that's actually kind of the, the apocalyptic moment for the state where there's this opportunity for us to destroy it without shedding a, blot, a drop of blood. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm also working on something I call the pedagogy of Bitcoin, which is essentially about uh, how the methodologies and models of our learning have been done to kind of trap us in this authoritarian system. And that through the autodidactic means of the Internet, there's this real capacity for us to learn and change our perspectives in a powerful way that can aid us much more deeply. Um, but who knows? I, I got to I got to find both the, the time and the capacity to, to actually get things published. But uh, I really love and appreciate the work that you do in, in helping, you know, both spread my work and the work of, of, of many other individuals in this field. And uh, it's always so great just to connect with like minds and, and uh, deepen the solidarity around our, our mutual mission of, of Bitcoin and liberating the world from fiat slavery. Eric, thank you so much. Uh, you know, uh, uh, somewhere in uh, one or two instances in your article, you, you talked about love. And, you know, uh, with all the sadness and desperation and sometimes really anger that, you know, sometimes I have the feeling we're not moving forward, uh, but even, you know, trying our best, doing whatever it takes to educate our, you know, brothers and sisters out there. But, you know, it's, it's in the end, at the end of the day, it's about, you know, unconditional love and empathy and truth and transparency and just, you know, sowing the seed. And, the, you know, the, this, uh, the, the cat is out of the bag. We've got Bitcoin and it's, and I think, um, uh, as uh, who's it? Uh, Brennan Quittum, who writes, you know, about mycelium. So I think the network's already there. Like this, this vast network, you know, of interconnectedness is already there. But maybe, like we talked just about, you know, recently about psychedelics. Maybe it's more of a Bitcoin is more sort of very extremely subtle, very slow, very micro dosages of 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 psychedelics. I think you know, for a lot of people. Oh yeah, <laughs> for for sure. Like it, it's. It's psychedelic in so far that uh, it's this assemblage of thought that's totally unique and different that you would have never expected before. But once you get that hit of it, it changes your perspective almost yeah. entirely, you know? And uh, I've even thought so far that like, there's probably some crazy dynamic feedback between Bitcoin and psychedelics. And so far of that, uh, there are these similar thought modules, the actual possession of psychedelics through Bitcoin. But uh, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, like, the knowledge that we're trying to share with others is a form of love because like it, it's, and it, it's a, a respectful kind of love that says, you know, I, I love you and respect you enough that I want you to have this form of wealth that even if I am against you and I want to take it from you, I can't, you know? And so please entertain it because, you know, I, I love you and, and I love humanity and I want humanity to have this opportunity for us to actually have a form of wealth that can't, be extracted from one another via any form of legalized violence or otherwise. Nothing to say. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> okay, Eric, Stephanie, you got any final thoughts? I mean, I'm going to reflect a little bit, a few minutes with Stephanie once you're gone, but any anything else you want to tell Eric or ask Eric? Yeah, maybe I briefly mentioned this. So, um, you, Kayvan, said that you have some issues when talking with others that they're not listening. And what I learned from this, I mean, of course, I also try to like bring some of the truth forward, but some, they are just not ready. And then it doesn't help if, if we push them. So what I decided is that I'm working as much on myself as I can to release any fears, because we also learn fears can make you manipulatable and then you can be controlled and steered in some way. And, but not closing down the heart, but still being compassionate to the self and to the others and still be loving. And then going forward on the path in the inside, when you can do it, can't do it in the outside then you need to do it in the inside. So maybe this, this is the last thing that I wanted to like share. <laughs> Excellent, I love it. And yeah, at the end of the day, lo love is really what's kind of propelling us forward. And choosing to shed that fear and to, to lead with an open heart is the most powerful thing that we can do in helping educate and, and spread awareness of what we're really trying to do. So th thank you both so much for, for having me and having this, this wonderful dialogue. It's always so exciting to get to share in this way. And I, I 
I deeply appreciate both of you with uh, uh, wanting to explore this with me. It, it's really fun and I really, really enjoy it. So thank you both so much. Right Talk so to much. you soon. Thanks so All much. All right, see you guys later. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, Stephanie. So I really thank so much for your time and it was uh, excellent questions you asked and uh, it was a really nice flow. You know, uh, fear is, um, uh, you know, a form of energy. And I, and I, I think people need to learn with, within themselves and for themselves, like how to convert this negative energy, this fear energy into whatever, creative energy. You know, often I say, you know, uh, out of necessity, out of pain, suffering comes, you know, this, this process of cre uh, creativity or, uh, you know, uh, transformation, reflection. So what did you think? Well, I have quite a lot to say on fear, actually. So I had my extreme awakening in September 2017. Um, I have experienced kind of energies moving through my body and it like really broke off or broke open my heart. And by um, opening this heart, I um, was became aware of so many emotions. I had no idea that there were. And they all came actually kind of rushing over me. <laughs> it was really hard because I never learned really how to handle them. I started a little bit of meditation a couple of weeks before. Uh, that was so good. Otherwise, it would have been even worse. And I somehow was in a situation and I needed to like handle it and survive kind of the emotion storms around me. And... Um, I had so much um, like fear also coming up and fear is like a really like sharp. It's like, it goes on all your, it's, oh, it's a really unnice feeling also when you feel it in your body and you're like, you want to flee and run and you know, everything is under tension. But um, at one point I learned how to really stay in the body in this moment, to really feel it in the body. And then I realized um, that it actually wasn't that bad um, because then you just feel it as some kind of dark veil that is like going on your body and mind. And you just, I was just sitting there and waiting and actually it was for 40 minutes and I can't tell you how much fear I transformed in this moment. And it was actually kind of life changing for me. It was also fear of death that triggered this moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, interesting. <laughs> yeah, a little bit later, I realized some more uh, details of, about the secret of what happens after we leave this body. So um, it is so crucial to go into these fears and to not fear it. Fear it's always fear of, um, how is it called? Fear of something. Uh, fear of something that is uncertain or that this fear doesn't make sense in fact so always when I had these kind of fears I later learned that actually it is nothing to fear it's just kind of an illusion and it's not that bad so um, yeah this I, I mean that was not the end <laughs> fears can be triggered every now and then so I worked extremely hard on existential fears I started one year ago to like really focus on this and it goes really deep into my childhood as well. Mm -hmm. And you know, the Bitcoin um, bust, so when it goes down, it always triggers some fears, you know? But that's awesome, you know? Bitcoin is also teaching you how to handle emotions. <laughs> and then, you know, don't not to just push it away and to compartmentalize, but yeah. to allow this in your body and to become a whole by reclaiming all these parts of yourself that you have lost when you split up a part of yourself by experiencing the emotion. Right, right. And you know, it's it's hardly known that a lot of uh, well-known uh, or you know famous uh, scientists or experts we know in, in, in you know different fields have either had many of them, you know, uh, uh, even Steve Jobs or you know anybody, entrepreneurs, inventors, engineers, uh, scientists. Uh, Many of them had uh, or have had, you know, either psychedelic experiences uh, or and or um, near death experiences. And I think it's a wake up call. So, you know, every human being, every soul has a different trigger or a key. And for me, you know, it definitely was one of them, uh, essentially uh, psychedelic uh, mushroom experiences. I mean, I got to you know admit that. And it it, 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 it it made me face, you know, my own fears, uh, so-called demons, you know, the, the fear of death also. 
and this is why it's it's now being uh, re uh, rediscovered uh, you know in in therapies in by by a lot of you know holistic doctors in you know whether it be depressive people or suicidal people or cancer uh, you know cancer sick people so uh, so yeah we could go you know deep very deep into this rabbit hole but i think uh, uh, it is all interconnected you know bitcoin the essence of bitcoin and the whole transformational uh, uh, you know, space that we're within, it's, it's all interconnected. So, yeah. So thank you so much again for your insights and your, you know, sharing your thoughts and yeah, vision. You're welcome. All right. Okay. Stephanie, talk to you soon. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. Okay. So I really love this interview. I really love this talk, this conversations. I mean, it really goes into so many uh, deep rabbit holes Please make sure you like, subscribe uh, my YouTube channel, follow me on Twitter. It's the heart blood of my work. And also uh, subscribe to my different podcast platforms. Write a positive review, a five-star rating review if, if you really loved it. And yeah, and if you have any wishes or questions for any future guests or topics, please let me know. My email address is hello at the totalconnector.com. You can reach me by DM or email or Telegram. And Thank you so much again for support and for listening and I hope you enjoyed that as much as we did.